Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today, and, and I am glad uh, to be back with you uh, here from this podium to talk to you about a very, very serious situation that we find ourselves in here in the state. Uh, the fact is that COVID-19 continues to be a scourge on our country and on our state. Here in Mississippi, we are seeing numbers as high as we have seen at any point since the very beginning. Remember, it was on March the 11th when we identified our first case. Over the last two weeks, we have seen day after day of very, very high numbers. The fact is that the crunch on our hospital system is not a hypothetical. It is not in the future. It is now. It is here. The overwhelming of our system, our healthcare system, is not a one-day event. It is a slow-moving disaster that looks like nurses without sleep, doctors who cannot take care of you to the best of their ability because they are stretched too thin, and ambulances that have to turn around because the hospital to which they are taking you cannot admit you because they do not have room for you. Because of that, we have worked with Dr. Dobbs and his team and ordered elective procedures to stop in several counties. We had orders in place that required hospitals to reserve 25% of their bed space for possible COVID-19 patients. Many hospitals in our state did not follow those rules. Now, this is what we've had to do. County-specific orders are most likely imminent. Additional restrictions on social distancing and potentially mask mandates. We've done it before. We've done it successfully before. And it is now likely time to do it again. Those orders will be finalized in the near future, and they will be out very, very soon. There's a lot more that's on the table, but nothing is going to work unless people will just follow the rules that are in place. I know that I sound like a broken record. Nothing matters if people will not change your individual behavior. Just like individual orders and additional orders were placed on our hospitals, I can see future orders on bars. I can see future orders on restaurants, which right now, many of them seem to be ignoring the rules. Make no mistake, I do not want to do any of this. I want us to be completely open. I want us to be completely back to 2019 normal, but we can't. We're trending worse, not better. Now, we're not the only state in the nation that has these challenges. In fact, many nation, many states across this nation are dealing with these issues. I want you to hear me loud and clear. This is real. It is here and it is here now. The situation that we have feared is upon us. Please protect yourself. Please protect your loved ones. Please wear a mask. Please try to stay home as much as possible. Seeing others break the rules and put their friends' lives at risk is not a reason nor an excuse for you to do the same. None of us have been perfect. We have all made mistakes. We have all made poor decisions. We've all done things with risk. We're all tired of this. I know I am tired of this. We're all ready for it to be over. We're also all at risk of being the person who gave this deadly virus to a loved one. I hope and pray that that can outweigh our desire to have fun. We live in hard times, but we have been called 
for this time. Working together, we can do this. Here in the capital complex region of our state, we have seen the devastation that can be caused by the spread of this virus. We have seen over the last several days with both our Lieutenant Governor and our Speaker being diagnosed with a virus. And many of their members and many of their staff members also being diagnosed. It's a real live reminder that this virus will not stop with anyone. It is dangerous. It can be deadly. Our death numbers have gone up significantly in the last two days. I'm telling you, I'm urging you, please pay attention. Please do the right thing for yourself, which will ultimately do the right thing for your neighbors. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dobbs to give us an update. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Um, as we look to, to the future, understanding where we are and understanding where we're going will be very important. We've been on a pretty remarkable tra trajectory over the past couple of weeks. I would hope that no one would find this even a remote surprise given our previous conversations. It's, it's something that we've been anticipating because nothing's really happened that would diminish the, the spread of disease in Mississippi um, regarding um, what we've seen with community transmission, people doing social events, crowding, et cetera. It's inevitable. We're reporting 700, I mean, sorry, 674 new cases today and an additional 30 deaths. In, the, in those deaths, um, the age range is 48 to 98, and 55% were in long-term care settings. As we mentioned before, a disease does not stand in a specific age group, and we had young kids get inf infected, and we said it's going to move up the age ladder, and inevitably it's going to spread to additional folks, and now we're seeing that in more vulnerable groups and in nursing homes and additional deaths. It's just happening. Keep in mind also we do have deaths that are just not as common in younger age groups. We have deaths of people in their 20s to 30s. So this is not something that only affects old folks, okay? If you're a young person, you're still at risk not only for illness but also for death. So please, please be careful. Um, as far as testing goes, we're seeing a massive increase in demand for testing. At our drive through site in Jackson, today we have scheduled 875 people, which is about five times more than our normal volume up until um, recently. So we're seeing a lot of demand. We know that in private clinics, there are significant delays in lab results coming back. Prevention is the key. As you go about your daily life, imagine that every person you, can, you encounter has coronavirus because in fact, they could. We know that much of the transmission happens from people who are asymptomatic, and we know that around 41% of super spreaders are in fact asymptomatic, no symptoms at the time that they're spreading it. So you have to assume that you're at risk at every single moment. And then the, how this culminates into stress on the healthcare system is not even remotely surprising either. Um, we've been monitoring very closely hospital capacity, especially ICU capacity, and within the Jackson area and other places, we've seen zero ICU beds day after day after day in numerous health, in numerous hospitals. And so we did have to take this action, uh, restricting elective surgeries that um, require hospitalization overnight, such that we can make more bed avail bedroom av bed space available for people with serious illness or with coronavirus. Um, that's something we're working closely with the hospitals to make sure that they can add that capacity and meet that need. But this is something that's going to be ongoing in the future because it's one of the mechanisms we have to make sure that we can increase bed availability by reducing these elective hospitalizations. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to do. I've caught a lot of grief. Two of the hospitals that um, were affected were two hospitals that I worked in as a physician. So um, I understand the pain that they're feeling. Um, the last thing I do want to mention is um, the outbreak at the legislature. We're continuing to work on it. Thus far, we have identified um, 36 cases associated with the outbreak, uh, 26 of whom are legislators. And that's all I have, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Mac is here uh, to give us an update on our emergency management uh, from our emergency management agency. Mac. Yep. Thank you, sir. I uh, want to report that uh, from the uh, uh, tropical storm that came through Cristobal, uh, we now have uh, uh, submitted two FEMA uh, within our timeline for the counties of Hancock, Harrison, and Jackson. Uh, we met our state threshold there. 
and we were able to get that uh, into them and we await uh, that to be approved. And this is, uh, is gonna allow us to be able to continue to do the beach cleanup. Uh, we had a five to six foot surge during that storm, uh, which uh, caused us some issues and uh, we'll, we're gonna be working on a public assistance uh, declaration on that front. Over the last couple of days, uh, we've delivered over 73 counties in our pod sites, uh, continue to support uh, the COVID response with uh, Dr. Dobbs and the governor's uh, direction. Uh, I think it's important to note that we've uh, traveled approximately 171,000 miles over the state of Mississippi uh, in the last couple of months. And uh, those uh, uh, active duty uh, guardsmen uh, for the state of Mississippi have done a fantastic job in uh, delivering those supplies to those uh, tier one uh, healthcare facilities, as well as doing hot shots when we have uh, outbreaks as uh, uh, designated by the Department of Health, we're able to get out there and deliver those uh, services, those uh, the PPE requirements those hospitals need uh, to be able to continue to do that. Over the next uh, couple of days, I, I do want to, I'm, I'm constantly getting alerts today of uh, flash flooding and thunderstorms uh, throughout the uh, southern part of the state, starting to rain on us a little bit here in the central. And uh, during this weekend, uh, we're gonna hit some, some uh, very high uh, heat stress conditions. So if you've got uh, uh, elderly family members and whatnot, please check on them, uh, pets as well. And uh, this also lends itself when you're trying to clean up after a storm to be able to, to, uh, to be out there and function and to get those things done. But also the flash flooding, uh, one to three inches, uh, this, this limited threat that we're going through. This is a daily routine, just this time of the year, just be ready for those afternoon showers. Uh, it will change behavior and uh, could cause some issues there. So that's currently what I have, uh, the state of uh, MEMA, per any questions. Well, well thank you and, and thank you to your team who continues to work uh, diligently day by day to help manage us through these challenging times. That's true of both the Department of Health and the Emergency Management Agency. Uh, just some really, really talented, dedicated people in both of those agencies, and I want to personally thank them. I hadn't had an opportunity to be here and do that over the last couple of weeks, but um, many, if not most of them, worked um, day after day, seven days a week for the last four or five months, and that they're just really true, dedicated public servants and dedicated Mississippians, and I want to personally on behalf of my family, thank uh, the members of the team that are working every single day uh, to try to make things better for our fellow Mississippians. With that, I'll open it to questions. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Governor. First off, it's great to have you back up here. We're happy to see that you and your family are healthy. Uh, I'd like to dive into, we, we've got six counties suspending certain surgeries, as you mentioned, with space reaching capacity. Dr. Dobbs yesterday applauded cities and counties at his press conference who are issuing uh, mask ordinances. Uh, you had some strong words as you began when it came to people following the rules. So with what we're seeing now, can you elaborate, dive into what the plan could be or, or should be when it comes to any statewide orders with mask ordinance under your administration? Right. Thank you uh, for that question and thank you for being here and thank you for wearing a mask. I appreciate that. Um, look, it doesn't matter what the words on the page say if the people of our state do not adhere to them. I would tell you that if you look at the orders that we currently have in place with respect to social distancing guidelines, with respect to keeping um, the number of uh, folks who gather for social purposes at a limited number, um, when you look at the other things that we have in place, if the hospitals had maintained 25% of their bed capacity uh, for COVID patients, as is required, um, then we'd be having a different conversation today. Uh, if everyone would follow the guidelines, we would be in a different position today. Um, I do think that it's probably true that, the, that there is a, uh, a slight variation of a strain of this particular virus that is even more, um, more, uh, contagious than what we've seen in the past and that's helping lead to more and more uh, cases uh, but we've got to adhere to it when you talk about local mask ordinances or even a statewide mask ordinance it is my firm belief that the way in which those mask ordinances work and the only way in which they work is if people in local communities actually adhere to them and the only way people in local communities will adhere to those mask orders, in my opinion, is if there is significant buy-in by the local community. There has to be buy-in by the leaders in the community. There's gotta be buy-in by the elected leaders in the community. There's gotta be buy-in by the business leaders in the community. 
There's got to be buy-in by everyone in the community. It's not just writing words on a page that makes this work. It's the people actually adhering to it. And so I'll give you some examples. And Dr. Dobbs and I met for way too long earlier today talking about a lot of these things. My view is when you look at those areas where it's actually worked, where we've really slowed the spread because of specific additional measures for specific areas. For instance, let's go back almost a month and a half to two months ago when we went into Atala County and Scott County and Neshoba County and Leak County and Jasper County and then later added Wayne County. We had buy-in by almost every single local elected official. They implemented, we implemented mask orders from the state for those specific counties, and it worked. Now, let's look at other counties, and I won't name names now, but if you're out there listening, you know who you are. We had mayors and local leaders. We had statewide orders in effect that didn't allow for baseball to be taking place. And yet we had some communities that just opened up anyway because they decided they knew better than the public health officials. That is not the way to slow the spread of this virus. And look, I'm not being critical of any individual. We've all made mistakes through this because none of us have ever gone through this before. And quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, what's happened in the past, what's happened in the last four months does not matter. What we've got to focus on is what are we going to do this afternoon to slow the spread? What are we going to do tomorrow? Understanding, by the way, the things we do this afternoon and the things that we do tomorrow aren't going to have any effect on tomorrow's numbers. Probably not going to have any effect on next Monday's numbers. We're two weeks or three weeks out from really having an effect on any measures that we put in place. Additionally, again, my plea to the people of our state is please pay attention. The virus is in your community. Dr. Dobbs said something earlier that I think is critically important. If you're out and about today and you look at someone, your mentality should be they probably have the virus and are contagious. Therefore, I should protect myself. As you know, I took a test earlier this week. Thank the good Lord, and only because of the good Lord, it was negative. But the reality is that testing is only as good as when you take the test. And so we have to just assume that as we as individuals, everyone that you're around, you should assume has the virus and you should socially distance and you should be smart. This is gonna go on for at least another three to four to five months, six months maybe, maybe even longer. We have to be smart. We have to work together. We have to care about one another enough to take the additional steps. Yes, sir. So, Governor, if you say we have to get buy-in on this mask wearing initiative, how are we going to do that? How can we get Mississippians to buy into that idea of you got to wear a mask? Well, uh, I, think, I think there's a couple of things uh, that, that we can do. Uh, number one, we've got to spend even more time as leaders, uh, those of us who have a microphone, expressing the importance of wearing a mask. The importance of not only wearing a mask, by the way, because wearing a mask is a good thing, but it is um, one of many things that need to be done. It's the little things that need to happen. For instance, on restaurants, we currently have a capacity limit on restaurants. Many of them are adhering to it, and I appreciate what they're doing. Some are not. If you are not adhering to the capacity limits at your restaurant, then we need you to start adhering to it. Because if you don't, you then are part of the problem, not part of the solution. We need everyone to adhere to the guidelines that are in place. We need every individual not only to wear a mask when they're in public, but to stay socially distanced. Let's not go to uh, parties at the river and hang out with 30 or 40 or 3,000 people. Because it is very likely that you are adding to the spread if that is something that you're doing right now. And so I think that's important. The other thing I will say is, you know, I'm often reminded, and we talk about it often in, in my office, I'm reminded of the, uh, the pastor 
from down in uh, Adams County that we brought up and had at one of our press conferences early on. Uh, the gentleman who made it very clear he didn't vote for me uh, when I called him, uh, he and I had a conversation. And he said, Governor, you call in to tell me that the state's going to shut down my church because if you are, we ain't shutting down. And I replied to him, I said, sir, no, I don't believe the government can shut down your church. I'm calling to ask you to shut down your church for a week or two to adhere to what we're trying to get accomplished. And he said, well, you're my governor, and if you're asking me to not have large gatherings inside, I'm willing to do it if you ask me to do it. And I think about that often because many of us in Mississippi just really don't like being told what to do. We don't like being told what to do by Washington. We don't like being told what to do by folks on either coast. And we don't even like being told what to do by somebody that we didn't vote for last year. We don't even like being told what to do by even some people that we did vote for last year. And I get that. And so I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm asking you. I'm asking you as one Mississippian to another. I'm asking you as someone who has a wife and three daughters in our state. It matters. Those of you who think the virus isn't real, I'm here to tell you it is. You look at our hospitalizations. On June the 27th, we had 490 people in hospital beds with COVID-19. The latest number I see is 648. That's an increase of 160 over what is a less than two weeks. At that trajectory, our healthcare system is going to be overwhelmed. Now, you may say, well, that's only 160 people in a state of 3 million. That's not that big a deal. What, I'm, what I want you to hear me say is that as these ICU beds, particularly in the regions where we've slowed elective procedures down, if they're, all the ICU beds are full, that doesn't mean that all the ICU beds are full just for those who, had, who have COVID. So you may not get COVID, but if you're in an automobile accident this afternoon, or if you have a heart attack this afternoon, and you need to be transferred to a hospital, and there is no room in the inn, so to speak, then you are putting... You, you are going to be at risk. And so what I'm asking my fellow Mississippians to think about today is if I don't adhere to the guidelines and I, receive, and I contract the virus, well, maybe it won't be that bad on me. Well, and that may be true. But if you spread it to two or three people who take up two or three ICU beds and then your daughter or your granddaughter is in an automobile accident or in a four-wheeler accident and they need to go to the hospital and there are no ICU beds available, then you're putting those individuals at risk as well. And that's what is so unique about where we find ourselves today. There is, there is not a governor in this country that believes more in personal responsibility. There's not a governor in this country who would stand up here and more adamantly defend one's ability to do stupid things to oneself. Government ought not be able to tell you not to do something stupid to yourself. I'm with you. The problem when you're talking about a virus that is so contagious is if you get it, you haven't just done something bad for yourself. It's likely you're going to spread it to someone else. And that's where the line changes from you doing something dumb that hurts yourself, which is well within your rights, to you doing something that hurts other people. What we're pleading for today, and I know I sound like a broken record, but it's what we've been pleading for for the last four months, which really worked well in March, in April, in May, and for the first part of June. We need, we need to return our mindset to mid-April. That's what we need to do as a state. We need to return our mindset with respect to the coronavirus to our mid-April mindset. 
Thank you, Renee. I have a two-part question here, uh, one for the governor, one for Dr. Dobbs, perhaps. Day by day, schools are releasing plans to safely bring students back. Governor, how committed are you that almost no matter what, schools start in the fall? Also, athletic directors and coaches are saying the High School Activities Association isn't giving them any guidance in terms of fall football. It's even been suggested moving into the spring. Dr. Dobbs, do you see any way football right now could be played this fall? Thank you, Dave, for, for those questions. Um, I believe the question to me was how committed am I to school reopening? I am 100% committed to schools reopening in a safe, responsible way. I am less than 100% committed to extracurricular activities, football or otherwise, being performed in front of large crowds uh, in the stadiums. We want to find a way to do it. We want it to be done right. Um, and, and so we're, we're looking at every option. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the MHSAA. Uh, they obviously oversee uh, high school sports for public schools, K through 12 in Mississippi. Uh, but when you talk about um, the Southeastern Conference, the NCAA and others, Many of them have not provided significant guidance on how college football should be played. And so we've got a lot of decisions and a lot of discussions to be had in the coming days and weeks uh, with respect to that. But I think it's very important from the long-term uh, educational needs of our students that we have a plan in place to get our students back in school. May not look exactly like it looked um, a year ago, but we need, I am 100% committed to trying to make that a reality. Uh, again, extracurricular activities, from my perspective, and I will uh, defer to Dr. Dobbs on his opinion as well, uh, is um, certainly uh, a little less certain. Um, and from, from my perspective, um, academics is a priority and kids gotta learn. So that's absolutely there and, and kids need to go back to school It'll be a different sort of scenario. There'll be some hybrid sort of online, in-person sort of stuff. And certainly I've been talking to educators, superintendents, the Department of Education, Dr. Wright on a regular basis. Um, as far as non-academic stuff, um, I think we have to do a really hard look at what the risk and the benefits are. Um, you know, some things are going to be low risk, um, you know, cross country where people aren't around each other. That's probably pretty easy to do if it's done properly. You know, certainly some of these other sports was a contact sports, one thing. And so trying to do that safely, um, I think, I think a real challenge is going to be if you have football and your offensive line is on quarantine, how are you going to play football? You know, I think the, the virus may have different ideas for us than we have for ourselves. But one of the things that absolutely does worry me is crowds and stadiums. I just don't see how that can um, go in any sort of normal state um, and um, anything we can do to uh, limit risk and, and also meet the needs of our kids I think we need to do um, and I, I do like the you know, thought of delaying you know till spring I think you know, it's a kind of a strange concept I think for us but um, we're in a bad spot right now we've, we've got more virus than we've ever had and um, and, I, and I hate it that our predictions have have been true but we're predicting more in the fall. So it's gonna be worse in the fall than it is now. So um, just, you know, we'll have to make decisions based on what our reality is. Um, Hunter Dawkins with the Gazebo Gazette has a question. Thank you, Renee, thank you, Governor. Uh, one question for you. Uh, this last week, there have been plenty of members of the legislature that have uh, contacted, well, not many yet, but there have been a few that have contact with the coronavirus. Um, how important is it that we get together with the legislature to a form of budget to uh, fund certain agencies, and including what you would express about the teachers, Governor? Um, what, what is your idea of when they need to get back and what, you know, giving that timeline of when the, the budget can be finalized? Well, thank you uh, for that question. Um, there, is, there is no question that, and, and you've heard me say it from here before, uh, the, the, there is and there was significant risk to large numbers of people gathering in the state capitol. Uh, that was true 
uh, last week. That was true the week before that, and that will be true next week. Given that, uh, I believe Dr. Dobbs said earlier, some 35 to 40 individuals have tested positive for the virus that uh, can be directly tied to the Capitol, uh, given the fact that today is Wednesday. Uh, at a minimum from today, I would say at least 14 days from today before it would even be remotely safe for the legislature to come back in to session. At least 14 days today, and even then, it would only be potentially remotely safe. Um, so what does that mean? That puts us in a difficult spot uh, because the legislature left without having a budget for the Department of Marine Resources. Uh, those of you on the coast know that. Um, that is not something uh, that I, they should be proud of. Uh, that is uh, very troubling to me personally. Uh, now, we have worked very, very closely with our legal team, uh, with the Department of Finance and Administration, as well as uh, with the leadership at the Department of Marine Resources. Uh, and we have so far been able to fund the, the most critical functions of that particular agency. Um, we are looking at ways to continue to do that. Um, it would be easier if we had a budget, uh, but the fact of the matter is we are in the middle of a public health crisis and we've got to make decisions based upon risk and reward. And it, in my opinion, it is too high of a risk for the legislature to come back to deal with that issue at least for the next 14 days. It is not fair to the people that are staff, to those individuals that have not uh, contracted the virus, to ask them to be back in that fishbowl of the Mississippi Capitol at least within the next 14 days. Now, again, that is my opinion. I'm, Dr. Dobbs is certainly entitled um, to disagree with that or agree with that or, or whatever he chooses to do, as, as uh, can other leaders. Um, with respect to the Department of Education, um, I'm very concerned, as I have pointed out over the last 24 hours, uh, with a particular um, budget item that I think is critically important, and that is the, the school recognition program. Uh, if the bill becomes law, as it is currently written, there will be 23,157 teachers that are entitled to more money who will get a pay cut this year. 23,157 teachers that earned more pay than what that budget bill allows. Now, I've had many conversations uh, with legislators and with some legislative leaders over the last 24 hours, and there have been a lot of uh, different viewpoints on why we find ourselves in the position that we're in. But again, I'm, I'm the kind of person, what's happened in the past is in the past. We've got to fix this. And I think that there's general consensus uh, amongst most that there is a desire to make sure that the school recognition program is funded at the level that it is supposed to be funded at. And so I will look and work with the legislature to make sure uh, that that happens. Uh, but we have got to make sure that those 23,157 teachers that have earned additional pay do not take a pay cut. Um, yes. Frank Porter with Y'all Politics. Hey, Governor, uh, just real quick, you mentioned yesterday in your social media post uh, of the issue with the timelines for bill signings. Um, given the fact that this has been an issue with this pandemic, have you given any thought to possibly asking uh, the lawmakers to extend those deadlines for future sessions? Well, what I would say, Frank, is there, there are some in the legislature that took intentional action to make it even more difficult for us to have adequate time to review the bills. And so I don't think it's very likely that that would occur, um, that they, that's just highly unlikely. Uh, the other thing I would tell you is it's constitutional, and so I'm not sure they could change it even if they wanted to. The problem that we have this year, and again, this is very much inside baseball, and I know that most, most people in the state don't care, but the challenge that we have this year is the fact that the legislature has chosen to not adjourn sine die. They have recessed 
until October. The challenge that that creates is the Constitution allows for 15 days to sign legislation once the sine die motion has been put in effect. But we don't have a sine die motion. We actually have a um, extension until October, and that changes the constitutional provision from 15 days that is normally allowed to the five days that have been allowed uh, this year. That's the reason that on Monday we had 40 bills due. That's the reason on Tuesday we had 65 bills due. And that's the reason that today we have 70 bills due. Uh, and I will tell you that the bond bill uh, is this tall, this tall. I think it's a 1,300 pages long, uh, but we have a responsibility in the executive branch of government to review each and every one of those bills, and what I want to assure the people of Mississippi of this afternoon is we're going to fulfill our obligation to do that no matter what it takes. Yes, sir. Th thank you, Governor. I'd like to sort of follow up on what WLOX just asked when it comes to the schools. So you acknowledge you are 100% committed and that there's some serious discussions that need to be happened within the next couple of weeks, though we're only a month away from schools from schools starting. And I just wanted to know, have you been in contact with the state board to discuss how schools will reopen safely? And if not, when to elaborate, you know, what that plan can be for teacher and student safety? What I would tell you is over the last four months, uh, Dr. Dobbs individually uh, and, and as a group and I individually and as a group have had many conversations with, um, with our leaders at the Department of Education. Uh, and they have in turn had many, many conversations with uh, the leaders in our local school districts. Uh, we need to continue to do that. Uh, we, are, we are a state that is different than some other states in that we give great autonomy to our local school districts and we want to do that. And so again, this is a, a topic in which we want to give uh, each individual school district the opportunity to set guidelines and plans. Um, they are in the process of doing that. Some of them have already done it. Some of them are continuing to do it. Um, and we've just got to decide uh, eventually if those plans that are, that are set in motion and put in place uh, do provide for the safest um, return to school possible for all of our kids. So you're saying that, you're, that, that your plan isn't like a, a whole statewide thing. You want to leave it up to individual districts to make well, the, their Well, that's choices. the system that we have in Mississippi. It's just the way in which the system works. We, we believe in local autonomy. We believe in local control. Uh, but we're not going to let... Um, but we're not going to let a third of our school districts not do any school and a third of our school districts do every single day in the classroom. So we're going to continue to figure out the best way to go. But what I have seen thus far is the vast majority of school districts uh, have a plan in place to return to school. Um, and we're going to continue to work with them to, to make sure that that is implemented properly.